where Ashley killed it and getting every question right, winning herself a $10 Amazon gift card, which is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm, uh, for people, we just been having people come in and out. We know everybody's busy. Everybody's got craziness going on. So I'm going to give, uh, but we did schedule, uh, put out the schedule to, so people knew when you would be talking. So, um, I'm going to give people a couple of minutes to come in just in case they wanted to hear you talk specifically. Uh, no problem at all. No problem at all. But if you wanted to introduce yourself to uh, the people here, that would be great. Yeah. And first, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I was really excited. And so, you know, I had it on my calendar and I was, <laughs> I was really excited about it. Secondly, I want to apologize because there's a smoke alarm that's going off in my house somewhere, <laughs> like the beeping, and I can't figure out which one it is. <laughs> so, so, and it just started about a few minutes ago. So I was like, oh my gosh. So, um, so just disregard that. No problem. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah, I'm Tanya Daniel. Um, I'm a childbirth educator, a doula, and the, the passion of my life is um, I'm an IBCLC, a, a board certified lactation consultant. And, um, and I love helping families navigate this breastfeeding journey. And so I've been doing birth work for and supporting moms for about 20 years. Um, I've been a board certified lactation consultant for the last 10. I'm, a, I'm actually up for recertification for the second time. I'm in October. So any happy thoughts that anybody has, around <laughs> I'm willing to take those. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I'm a mom of five. Um, four that are um, that are living and, and that are here and really pushing me forward. Um, I had one, and I, I share this story a lot. I have one that was a preterm birth, um, and that really started my journey. Um, it was the sec my second pregnancy, and so that really started my journey around um, maternal health and and what things impact maternal health and birth outcomes. And one of the things that um, that really pushed me towards the lactation piece of it was when I was pregnant with my first child, you know, I didn't really have a lot of people in my family that breastfed, you know, and that's not, to be honest, that's not something that's unheard of specifically since we're talking about um, Black Maternal Health Week. That's, that's not something that's not unheard of um, in, in a lot of the Black communities and specifically with my family. And so it's not that they weren't really supportive, they just didn't know how to support. And so looking in the community, I didn't really see a whole lot of support there either. Um, I'm in rural Granville County, and you know, and typically the only thing that was really there was um, WIC services, which were great. But if you didn't, you weren't getting WIC services, that resource wasn't available to you. And so that's where I kind of stepped in and was like, okay, I'm going to try to navigate this, you know, on my own and getting resources. Resources, you know, that was about 45 minutes away. But, you know, I was going to, after I got through it, I was like, you know, what can I do to help other mamas that are like me, that are wanting to do this journey and maybe some first timers and, you know, really what they can do. And so I kind of started on that journey, journey with that. And so, you know, with a lot of support from my husband going, okay, we can, we can do this. We'll figure, <laughs> we'll figure it out. And then helping a lot of friends and other people. Um, and, and using, you know, I hate to say it like this, but I tell my kids all the time, using them as guinea pigs of, okay, well, that didn't work too well. <laughs> Let's try this, you know, and so, and, and, you know, working with that, but even in my preterm birth, I think a lot of providers forget, especially for those moms who have gone through loss or anything like that, that the breastfeeding still happens. Um, the, I'm not, well, not the breastfeeding, the lactation still happens and how to navigate through that. And, and I didn't really have anybody to even address that that was a thing that I, um, at that point, you know, I, I was almost, you know, six, six months, I was six months pregnant and had a birth. And so my body didn't know that I didn't have a baby to feed. And so I went through that whole process there. Um, and so it was a learning experience for me. And I, I, I call Terrence my little, uh, my little angel that taught me some things that other people didn't teach. And so that's where I kind of started on that journey, you know, on helping mamas to be confident about breastfeeding um, and really allowing themselves to, you know, to, have, to be kind to themselves and give themselves a little bit of grace. So that's about me in a nutshell. <laughs> 
I think you're muted, Sarah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, I do it. I do it too. <laughs> no, that's great. I I've been uh, avoiding the mute. I have a wonderful husband who took the dog away for yeah. <laughs> um, for today since he knew he was going. So I've been able to stay unmuted all day. But um, uh, we uh, that's great, and we're so thankful that you're here, and so uh, thankful that uh, that can be recognized because it still is a big. Uh, yeah. disparity, especially in our area, that uh, uh, breastfeeding has become not taboo, but uh, it did not not necessarily the norm either. And we're slowly getting back to that, which I, yeah, which I think yeah. Is great. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's been that's been a great thing. It's been a great thing to see the transition that more and more people, and even with platforms like this, mm -hmm. that more and more people are seeing that you know it is the it is and it should be the norm. And, and how to really support moms and families, and even as providers, you know, what supports we can give as well. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. And can't wait to hear your talk. Um, I think uh, I'm going to let people in kind of as they, uh, if they choose to filter in, but um, we are also recording this, so we will post it up for later. Um, if anybody would like to see, I'm, I'm going to have time codes on everything so everybody knows where everything oh, is. Cool. Um, so uh, if you would like to started on your uh, talk you can go ahead yeah yeah you know and, and I was trying to think you know during this whole time because I um and as people who know me know I can talk forever about <laughs> about breastfeeding and I was like okay Tanya what can you talk about within 15 minutes you know that really could make some impact and you know really encourage um, moms or either expectant parents or new moms and so one of the things that I really thought about was and I get this question a lot is okay what can I do to prepare myself for breastfeeding you know, I get it when, you know, when they're pregnant and I get it, you know, just when they first have babies and they go, okay, I'm really thinking about this breastfeeding thing. You know, what, what types of things do I need to um, be cognizant of? And typically there are three things that I usually say, and they're not the three things that you would probably hear from uh, a childbirth educator or a pediatrician or an OBGYN. And that first thing is pretty much if you're planning on breastfeeding or thinking about breastfeeding, first of all, prepare yourself mentally um, for that. And when I say prepare yourself mentally, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do anything really big and psychological, but really remind yourself that this is something new, that whether or not you've breastfed before with another child or whether this is your very first time, this experience with this particular baby is going to be something that's new. So give yourself some grace. <laughs> And I, I use the term a lot, I call breastfeeding virgins. You know, this is your first time, you know, whether or not you've done it before, this is the first time with this baby. This baby has never met that breast before. You have never met this baby before. So it is a dance, a, it's a relationship. And so give yourself some grace to be able to say, okay, that one didn't go well, let's try for the next one. Okay. Or, and sometimes, you know, be your own cheerleader. Then when you say, okay, well, that went really well, but the next time may not. And, you know, and give yourself some grace to be able to settle in that and say, okay, we're learning, we're progressing, just like any other relationship. When you're in a, a, a friendship or a dating relationship or a marriage relationship, it takes some time to learn. So give yourself some grace to be able to do that. That's the very first thing, because I think when, when moms get to the point when they're like, okay, I don't have to be perfect. I'm going to mess up, but that is an opportunity to learn that when they realize that, then they take some of the stress off of it. Because I don't think they also realize that the more stressed you are, the more your body doesn't work towards the breastfeeding. <laughs> so if you can give yourself that little caveat to say, okay, I'm learning. I learned from this, you know, and, I, and a lot of times when I'm working with moms, I ask them, they call me and they cry and I go, okay, what went wrong? Okay. And then they go, well, this didn't happen. I say, okay, now we've gotten that out of the way. What went well? And then they're like, oh, well, you know, well, the baby did calm down when I held. Yeah, the baby did calm down. So, hey, that's a win. So that's one of your fallbacks. So if it doesn't go well the next time, just hold the baby skin to skin, you know? So giving them some things to be kind to themselves, to realize that this is a journey and they have, you know, be able to learn. The second tip that I tell them to make sure they find their squad. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I absolutely love the Wizard of Oz, all of them. I have, <laughs> have all of them. And I think of myself, I said, okay, if I were Dorothy, what things would I need in order to get to the land of Oz? 
okay, if I need to get to home. So I said, the first thing I would need, I would need to find somebody who, who has brains. You know, she was looking for somebody with a brain, the scarecrow. So find somebody who knows the techno, the technical things that are going on with, with breastfeeding. So it could be a, a, a you know, a community lactation counselor, it could be a, a, um, a childbirth educator, it could be a doula, somebody who kind of knows the technicalities of it. It could be a lactation consultant, you know, any of those things. Find somebody with brains. Find somebody who has some courage. Find other moms who have gone through it <laughs> and have survived and looked on the other side of it and said, hey, you can do this. You know, this is how you do it. I'm, I'm you know, I'm cheering for you. I'm, I'm rooting for you. And then make sure you have somebody with some heart. And typically that is somebody who's close to you. It can be a friend, it can be a partner, it can be a spouse or somebody that's close to you that, that cares about you passionately that can say, okay, you need to take a break. <laughs> Let's do something fun. Somebody who knows you in and out. And so that's why I say, you know, that, that courage and brains and heart, finding somebody for your squad. And a lot of times, one of the things that I tell people that I think they forget about is they look for a support group after they've had the baby and when they start running into problems. I tell people when you're pregnant and you're even thinking about it, find some support groups then while you're still pregnant. That way you can see that it, everything is not perfect, you know, but people are still able to enjoy their babies. You know, they're, they're able to get through that and navigate through that, that it, that it is possible that they can see some hope. So I tell them, you know, find a support group and get your squad, okay? And the last thing that I typically tell them to do after they've done those different things is then get education, okay? With the education, get a childbirth class, get a breastfeeding class, find somebody who can actually teach you the things about the breastfeeding. Because most people tend to think that, okay, if I wanna breastfeed, I need to learn how to latch. Well, that's gonna be kind of challenging if you don't have the baby right there with you, because you can watch something, but it's challenging to learn. And so you're overthinking a lot of things when you really don't have the baby right there to, to, to teach you. So get the education ahead of time so you know what to expect. And so that's when I typically dive into, okay, this is your baseline, okay? First thing you, I want you to know is you are not gonna have five ounces of milk an hour after that baby's born. <laughs> Because a lot of people, if they don't have the education, they don't, they're thinking that. And they're thinking, as soon as I have the baby, I'm supposed to have all this milk and then everything is going to be fine. It's not. It starts out with the colostrum. And that may be little drops. It may be little trickles. It may be even little glistenings. But the more stimulation you have on that breast, the more milk you can produce. All the baby needs in the first hour or two is a teaspoon. Hand expression can be your friend, <laughs> but you're going to learn that through education and how to do that. And that can be through videos, that can be through a class, that can be somebody actually showing you. So that's okay, you know, find out that. And um, typically I tell them as well, around and the more stimulation you get going, around day three to day five, that's when you'll start to see the milk pick, pick up. Okay. And so when I let them know that they're not freaking out <laughs> when they've been in the hospital that first 24 hours, and it's like, you know, they, they want to supplement, well, put the baby skin to skin, ask them how to hand express, you know, get them to show you. The nurses are typically, you know, that's one of the things that they're trained to do, especially if you're in a breastfeeding, um, breastfeeding friendly hospital, a baby friendly hospital. So that's the first thing, you know, get the stimulation and knowing the milk, how the milk travels, how often the feed at least eight times in 24 hours. I use the tagline a lot of times, eight or more in 24, okay? If you are not putting that baby to breast or stimulating the breast at least eight times in 24 hours, then we're not gonna get the supply that we need. And so I get that in their head, eight or more in 24, okay? So that's it. And so, well, how do I know if they're getting enough? Well, the way you find out how much is going in is how much is going out, <laughs> is coming out. So I tell them for every day of life, they should have at least one wet diaper and one dirty diaper up until the first six days. So day one, they need to have one wet diaper, one dirty diaper. When you tell them that day one, they're like, oh, well, I don't need to have like a whole pack of diapers because they've heard that so much that newborns use so many diapers. So if you say, okay, the first day they just got here, they're just learning. So our job is to put the baby to breast at least eight, eight or more times. 
or you are stimulating, whether it's hand expression or pumping, at least eight or more times, get the milk in the baby. And then when that comes out, all I'm looking for the first day is at least one wet diaper and one dirty diaper. Second day, two and two. Third day, three and three. And guess what typically happens around that third day? The milk supply picks up. So it's gonna have more wet and dirty diapers. And then talking to them about what those diapers look like. And so as I do that and I say, okay, between day three and day five, you know, we should start seeing it pick up some. You know, and I talked to them a little bit about some of the challenges, you know, because people ask about engorgement and different things. I'm like, you know, that may happen, but if you're feeding very frequently and emptying the breast, you know, we can get past that. And that's a, that's a flag that I tell them if it gets to the point where it's very uncomfortable, call your support system, call a lactation consultant, they can give you tips, but don't focus on that now. Don't focus on that, focus on getting the baby at the breast or stimulating the breast. Okay. And, and then I also tell them, they said, well, what if something happens and my baby doesn't latch well? The focus, get the milk in the baby. So it could be through spoon feeding. It can be through syringe feeding, <laughs> you know, or it can be just kind of dripping or letting the baby just kind of lick there until it licks, <laughs> it licks it off. There's a lot of different ways. So when you take a lot of that stress off of what we see as a society of the stressors and the, the harms of of trying to navigate through this breastfeeding, you know, if we reduce that stress, a lot of moms have that ability to be able to get past those first couple of weeks. And I tell them, if you can hang in there for the first two to four weeks, you got it, you know, and just focus on the day. And a lot of times when I, um, I have moms, actually I had a mom that called me the other day and she said, I just don't know, I gotta go back to work. I said, well, sweetie, when are you going back to work? Next month, I'm like, okay, so what's today? The 15th. Okay, well, let's just stay on April 15th <laughs> and we'll worry about next month when we get there, but let's just stay April 15th. So a lot of times what moms will hear me say, I go, you know what I'm gonna say? And they're like, yes, today is, I was like, exactly. Today is this day, let's stay here and let's focus on being successful right here. So those are in a nutshell, the pretty, pretty much the tips that I give to moms to kind of help them out um, in the beginning when they're first starting out. So is the, you know, making sure they're prepared mentally, making sure they have the support, you know, what, what that ever that looks like, and really just making sure they have the education. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya. For, that's all uh, great and amazing. And uh, we definitely, uh, we're, um, if you have a couple of minutes to take uh, questions, uh, yeah. that would be great. If anybody, uh, everybody can, I, I have it set so you can unmute yourself if you can, if you would like to, if anybody has any questions or comments or anything for Tanya, feel free to open up about them. Um, <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> okay. Well, since nobody's going, I'm going to say thank you so much for these <laughs> wonderful. Oh my gosh, it's so good to hear somebody being so practical with, especially the stress issues, because it is really the stress of it is just. I see the biggest. Thing that causes all the other problems and it's so wonderful to hear a lactation consultant saying relax it's okay because i'm just finding more and more these consultants are making these women crazier you got to have this and you got to do that and you got to have this and it's this many times and this many minutes and and these women have all this to-do list and oh my gosh no wonder they're stressed out so thank you so much for this attitude and approach <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome you're welcome Love it. And like I, like I said, a lot of it came from my experience. And that's why I wanted to become a lactation consultant because I was, I was, I was frazzled, you know, and I'm like, this is, you know, I don't have any, who, who would I, and they're telling me all these different things. And I, you know, in 45 minutes to get to my nearest lactation consultant. And I'm like, there is no way. And there were many times that I was like, I'm done. But I kept thinking in my head, but I don't want to be done, <laughs> you know? So I was like, what, what do I do? And so that's why I became a lactation consultant. And, and specifically, I was a lactation educator because I worked at the health department. But I was like, I need the credential because I need to be at the table to tell people, hey, we're stressing these moms out. Let's, <laughs> let's, yeah. let's make it better for them. Yeah, yeah but thank you. Thank you. I'm so yeah. glad that you're just taking it down to the today is, is okay. You're all right. 
Tanya, if you uh, have an extra couple of minutes uh, to talk, I found in my experience that a lot of moms um, don't know, um, aren't sure about breast milk storage, if they're pumping either for if, when they go back to work or if they just, uh, my nanny mom had just a ridiculous supply with her, with her second baby. And she like ended up donating like over 500 ounces of breast milk over supply. Like, and, um, yeah, it, kind of, kind of craziness. So the proper storage and what you can do, uh, for the, those kinds of things, because I found in postpartum that a lot of moms don't know what they can and cannot do with the breast milk they, they pumped, but their baby maybe isn't eating yet. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times I, I get this question a lot and typically I, I ask people what um, kind of like the guidelines of what they're trying to, what they're doing is or if they're just storing the milk just because they have an oversupply mm -hmm. and they're wanting to use it for later, if they're trying to use it, you know, for going to work for the next day, which is a totally different topic. Uh, we, we're going to work and what to, what to do because people think that they're supposed to have this, you know, months worth of storage when they get ready to go back to work. You don't, you just need a couple of days to start because you'll be pumping once you get to work. But anyway, that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> but, um, but typically in the refrigerator, typically we usually say about four days, you know, three, two, between two to four days in the refrigerator, you know, and try to use it um, in, the, or in the order that they receive it. I mean, that they're pumping it. Use the, the first milk they pumped um, first before they use, you know, put it by date in there. And first. Prefer, right, first in, first out. And so when they're freezing the milk, it's pretty much the same thing, the same thing. About six months, um, in a in a deep freezer is typically when um, you know six months. Sometimes people can go a little bit. Of course, the Academy of Pediatrics says a lot of different things, but breast milk we know has a lot of good stuff in it that can <laughs> that can protect them and store it properly. But about six months, um, and typically I tell people when they get to the point where they're they're six months and they're still not using it, try to go ahead and use that older supply, and you can use it other ways besides just in. Uh, just in just directly feeding the baby because it because if it because if it's six months then you that baby probably is getting to the point where it's having cereals having foods different things you can incorporate it in there and and add it in add it into their add it into their diet um and if you want to donate it you can donate it but most of the time what we're usually saying is you want to be able to store the milk properly in a deep freezer. Now, if it's in a regular refrigerator freezer, you may have to use it a little bit more quickly because of the, the temperature change in, you know, opening and closing that freezer. But if a deep freezer, the temperature is typically constant with okay. that. Great. That, I got so excited when you said use it other, other ways. I've used breast milk in so many recipes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just yeah. Add it on in and it's great. It, it just add it on to anything because it, it really will mix. Well, especially if it's something that's not, um, that, that you're not necessarily cooking. Mm -hmm. um, but, but even with sometimes there, I mean, I've heard people say, well, I mix it into, you know, the cereal after they've done that and the oatmeal. And I was like, yeah, after you've cooked it, add it in there. Mm -hmm. um, I used to use it for mine, even when after the, you know, cool it down a little bit. I was like, oh, well, it was a little bit too warm and I'll put the breast milk in <laughs> You know, and, and temper it down some. Um, whereas not having, of course, it wasn't boiling, but you know, it's not going to typically mess up the integrity of the milk with that. It's going to get that milk still in the baby um, and provide those benefits. So yeah, great. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. I know that you had uh, not <laughs> an extensive amount of time, but. Um... Well, I told you I will talk all day. <laughs> so this is this is perfectly fine. Is yeah, perfect well, fine. thank you so much. Uh, they're really amazing tips and things, and I agree with Annette that it's it's so nice to hear that the pressure is really the big thing that we have to change yeah. about it, and um, and that's so important to just relax and take it day by day. Right. And um, uh, if I could just do a personal story, one of the one of the reasons that my nanny mom had such an oversupply was because she had an undersupply for her first child. So she was really worried about having an undersupply again. And so she was more, we had the freezer stocked with lactation cookies, with smoothies, with extra this, extra everything. And she was so confident in having all of that on standby, even before she gave birth, that it, we never even ended up using it. it was it was so not a problem and I really believe that that was why she her supply was so 
that and her second baby was much smaller than the first, but that's a different thing. <laughs> um, but, um, but, and I really believe that that was the reason is she was so rest assured that she had all of that stuff there when, when she would need it. And then she didn't, didn't need it in the end. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times that's, that's what happens, especially, like I said, even when people have subsequent babies there, you know, that, that first experience is kind of imprinted for that second one, you know, and we have, we just really have to reframe it, but then providing the supports there because that, that reality of that stress of, I don't want this to happen again, that's real. And that replays, that record replays over in their heads over and over again time. Sometimes we just have to pick the needle up and go, okay, we're going to put another record in <laughs> going to put another record in and make this, a, make this a better experience. So I do appreciate you having me on here and for everybody who's here. Yeah. I, I appreciate you listening. <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. Um, and I'm going to, if it's all right with you, I'm going to share your information with oh. everybody after, um, after we're done so that people know that you're a resource and know that they're, um, I said in the beginning, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was to let mothers uh, in the community know that they have a community behind them. They have resources and they have support. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll, they'll be able to reach out to you and, and really know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Reach out to me. I'm, <laughs> I'm here. I'm willing to help. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tanya. It was so great hearing you speak. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, have a good rest of the day.